as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what, how did you, when did you start to form the idea of, you, when did you start to hone in on your direction of where you were, where you were going to head to? So I've always had, I've always had goals. I've always had aspirations and whatever I'm doing, it's, it's relates to that particular sort of, um, that goal. So when it was Navy diving, when I was going through my course, it was to pass my Navy diving course. Once I passed, like, again, I felt a little bit lost in a way. I didn't have a, a direction. I wanted to get promoted, but mm -hmm. I was getting a bit left behind. Um, so then I left the Navy and I started a, a career in offshore diving. And my goal was saturation diving. That's the pinnacle of the diving industry. So for everybody that, uh, that doesn't understand, you were a Navy diver. Are you saturate saturation diving in the Navy? No. So they used to do saturation diving in the Navy. Um, but I think that went out. 80s, 90s, um, probably due to money. Um, the Navy just couldn't afford to sort of put people through that. There was a lot of training, a lot of sort of science behind it, a lot of trial and errors. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we just, the Navy divers got rid of the saturation training. So for anybody who doesn't know what saturation diving is, what, how would you best describe it? So the term saturation diving comes about is we're physically saturated in that gas that we're breathing. So when I'm offshore, I breathe a mi mixture of helium and oxygen. Um, because 100% oxygen becomes toxic below 50 meters and the air that we're breathing today is a mixture of oxygen nit and nitrogen and we can't use nitrogen or we can't use air because nitrogen becomes narcotic at a certain depth so it's like being asked to to um, to work under the influence of drugs or alcohol it's just not going to work um, so there's a couple of gases that they can use that can be compressed quite easily hydrogen is the first one but um, if you compress hydrogen you create a, a really good bomb um, mm. and helium is the other one but the only problem with helium is sucking on a helium balloon you, mm -hmm. you breathe with a squeaky voice so um, what were the choices uh, the first thing you said with uh, helium was I thought of the Hindenburg <laughs> so <laughs> I thought probably not the best thing to oh, the hydrogen the, yeah, the yeah. hydrogen part <laughs> yeah. the, the Hindenburg was fully hydrogen yes. burst into flames exactly uh, oxygen uh, again space shuttle mm -hmm. That it wasn't the space shuttle; it was one of the one of the space missions, yep. and the the capsule was full of oxygen, mm -hmm. burst into flames. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so helium probably sounds like a good alternative. Yeah. The squeaky voice yeah, is kind of funny, I guess. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you get used to it? You do get used to it very quickly. I mean, it's uh, you're getting paid an awful lot of money to be in that chamber, <laughs> um, and uh, it's quite nerve wracking. There's a lot of pressure on you. So even your first ever job as a saturation diver, you're you're a bit like a rabbit in the headlights, a deer in the headlights, right. that you, you're taking in so much information that the fact that you're breathing with a squeaky voice just sort of, it's a bit funny sometimes, and it makes some people's stories a little bit funnier, but yeah, it's not often that you're... But you're outwardly quite, you're calm and collected mm -hmm. and, and very measured, yeah. but we've, we've just went into finding out the internal and the external is not quite exact. They don't align. So you've got, yeah, they don't align, yeah. right? So you've got this situation where... You've went from navy diving to offshore diving, mm. and then you want to get to saturation diving. Yeah. High risk. Yeah. High reward. Lots of pressure. Yeah. yeah, yeah lots yeah. of re great reward because yeah. it's it's very well paid, mm. and rightfully so. Yeah. You're given the risk, and then you're going into this environment where you've up to pressure. Yeah. Not just the air pressure, you know, the pressure of the <laughs> gas, but the pressure of the, yeah, me yeah. the mental pressure, and you've got this. Have you still got this disparity between this difference between the internal you? Yeah. and the external so that's when i guess they do align is the fact that when it comes to my abilities or like working again like i say leading back to m my strong worth eth work ethic of my dad um i'm super confident in my abilities in that sense so i knew that i was a decent diver i could do the job um so i am quite confident in that sense that you know when it comes to things that i that I know I'm pretty confident in it. It's more the social aspect of my confidence that sort mm. of dwindles away and it wasn't really, it, it, it was non-existent really. Um, so yeah, to answer that question, I think that I was super confident that I would be able to do the job and, mm. and I, would, I would do it pretty well. Then. So would you, I mean, did you feel that you had, I mean, it, it sounds like, I don't know if it felt like this to you, but it sounds like you had an ongoing perpetual imposter syndrome that varied yeah. in degree. <laughs> yeah. That's what it sounded like. Yeah, it sounded yeah. like, hey, look, 
you know what I'm projecting on and what I'm able to do doesn't really match. So I'm yeah. I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of an imposter. I'm mm. in these situations where ha- my ability needs to shine through mm. how I feel my personality is. Of so you you're at this sort of constant battle internally yeah. of push. You, you you feel comfortable pushing your ability. Mm-hmm. But you've got that certain discomfort that your personality yeah. isn't moving at the same rate. Yeah, of course. But I think you know everyone suffers from imposter syndrome at one point in their life, and I still suffer it with the combat journal. You know, it's, mm. it's so much of an unknown for me that I th- sometimes think to myself, "The hell am I doing?" Um, but yeah, I think that as long as I've got a goal to work towards, I've got a clear vision, and and I know that I'm going to get there. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of when. Um, so I wasn't, despite the fact that I was absorbing an obscene amount of information, I was nervous whether I was going to do well, despite the fact that I knew I was capable of it. You know, we all make mistakes. It's the human factor. But I think I knew that I was going to, even breaking into the offshore industry and doing surface supply diving, first of all, um, I knew that I was going to get to the saturation diving eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when I got into the saturation diving, it's despite the fact that I didn't have a further goal to work towards, it, it, there's so much information to, to obtain. So you, it took me, I think, f- almost five years to the day to actually feel settled in the job and not worry about the dive plan that was coming in, whether I was going to worry about impressing in my job or making mistakes or anything else. I think about five years to, to do almost every job that was that was sort of asked of me and and to know that, just because what it says in the dive plan doesn't actually mean that that's actually what's going to go to plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, it was only after that five year point that I thought, okay, well, I need to now have a new objective because I'm not working towards anything anymore. Um, and I don't like that feeling in myself because I feel as if I'm taking my foot off the gas and I'm not working to my full potential. So I need something to aim for, to, mm. to strive me on, to, to give me that little bit of fire. Um, and then that turned into to combat journal. 